Disclaimer, much of what I'm about to say comes from the perspective as a guy that 90% played this game on Ultimate and as a guy that got into speedrunning in the Ultimate mode in the first game. Needless to say, that background has had an impact on my views on this game. So we had Bloodstained Curse of the Moon 1, a Castlevania style game by Koji Igarashi that stood as a big fuck you to Konami. We quick scoped it. I've taken a few of the higher positions on the leaderboard since then, tailing some of the greatest speedrunners out there, and I've dabbled, and I mean dabbled with Curse of the Moon 2. The reason is that the sequel takes a left turn in some of the game design and options available to it at launch. And I know you guys watching our quick scopes are sick of hearing me say this, but in some ways good and some ways not so good. Seriously, I'm about to print that on a t-shirt. I'm sick of saying it, I know. Also, despite my speedrunning background with the first game, I still had to basically play the game casually at first because my category ultimate mode is locked from the start. This means I had to do about two to three playthroughs of the regular mode, which I wasn't accustomed to from my time spent with Curse 1, and I needed to go through the episode two route, which features an insane spike in difficulty. Despite starting the route with two characters already available to switch between, you have to play the rest of the harder stages now with a harder difficulty and one character down the rest of the way. It was not easy. This actually led me to a lot of frustration and I ended up putting the game down several times until I had enough and shelved it. That is, until I started to see the speedruns coming out of this game for my beloved ultimate category. People were doing some insane tricks that I wanted so badly to replicate and try on my own and they were posting some really fast times on speedrun.com. There was also my good friend Joe inspiring me to pick this game up every so often. You may recall that I mentioned him in the first game's quickscope. He was the one that introduced me to Curse the Moon 1 and speedrunning. In mid-2020, we both got the game on Switch so that we could play the new, highly touted co-op mode, only to be disappointed when it turns out they didn't put in an online option for that. Yeah, that was a really bad choice, especially at the height of COVID. As you can see, getting into this game initially was turbulent. But nevertheless, I pushed forward. I dragged myself through the pain and suffering of episode 2 and that stupid auto-scroller in the final episode. But then I had reached the promised land. This was what I loved about Curse of the Moon, but with the addition of three unique characters. Dominique is essentially Miriam, but with a DuckTales style pogo attack and some neat weapons. She can even revive fallen party members, which comes in handy in some of the more brutal parts of the game. Robert is a character in a Castlevania spiritual successor game with a gun. A fucking gun. He can snipe enemies from really far off, crawl, and even jump off of walls. If you read the cutscene dialogue, he's a bit of a dickhead, but a great asset in navigating around stuff. And finally, they gave us a corgi inside of a tank. Yeah, I feel like the whole corgi craze was over ages ago, but that's besides the point. This character introduces a different type of Castlevania character that once again, we've never seen before, and it really changes up the combat. Hachi can hover over a short period of time, go invincible, is invulnerable to spikes, and most importantly, takes considerably less knockback. So during a lot of points as speedrunners, we just tank through hits with Corgi for the iframes, but also to not risk getting thrown backwards into a pit, leading to instant death. Hachi is kind of like you're playing Tails from Sonic Adventure 2, but better. And so this point cannot be made clear enough. As soon as you get to ultimate mode, the game just opens up. Everything before was torturous and unenjoyable compared to where we left off with the previous game. But now that we have the abilities granted to ultimate Zangetsu, the tables have turned. Whereas before we were ill-equipped facing bosses that are far out of our reach with multiple attack patterns, we don't have to worry about not being able to make contact because something is out of reach, or that we just can't run through a part of a stage because there are too many obstacles blocking our path. Zangetsu now has a combo attack you can achieve by mashing the attack button, and they even beefed up his sub-weapons. All of his sub-weapons are now stronger, including Demon Essence, which allows you to do a Ninja Gaiden or Metroid-type screw attack when in the air. This buffed sub-weapon Weapon allows us to go on chewing through enemies and not worrying about most of what stands in your way. And I say most because the game still manages to squeeze every ounce of concentration and fortitude out of the player. This is still a hard game. And some of the rooms you are expected to clear, especially for speedrunning, will push you to your limits. 
Speaking of speedrunning, it was, and still is, a very intimidating game to just pick up and run. It ain't all sunshine and roses. As early as stage 3, you have moving platforms on waterfalls and simultaneous enemies to deal with that demand a perfect route needs to be taken to get through unharmed, and also survive. The speedrun route here is pretty safe, but still, sometimes stupid shit will happen, like accidentally landing on a platform without realizing, losing your momentum, and making you walk off to your doom helpless. In stage 4, you have to deal with ice physics, which of course, make for a few difficult parts. We go visit a volcano for stage 5, where you have to dodge ceiling lava and upside down volcanoes. At this point, I am convinced that Iga is a fan of AVGN. In the volcano stage, you have to make yourself comfortable with the idea of narrowly escaping hot molten death at every step of the way. But thankfully, the boss is simple once you know what to do. Oh, and speaking of bosses, you eventually come to Titan Common. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. The boss of stage 6. He is this game's RNG nightmare. Even with Zengetsu's ultimate abilities, it is still basically impossible to hit him. You have to wait for the stupid rising platforms, which are entirely dependent on RNG. So, that means you either get good RNG, with good positioning and timing on the platform slash boss for a quick titan fight, or you get bad RNG, and any hopes of a decent time go straight down the toilet. Come on. Curse 2 is no joke, but at this time, I'd like to talk about some of the changes they made to the game. First, the bad ones, some of which feel nitpicky, but they do hinder the fun of speedrunning. Boundaries have been adjusted so that going out of bounds is completely out of the question in this game, meaning no fun door skips or zips. Then there's even smaller stuff, like weird things that they just decided to change for some reason. When you complete a stage and get your new character, in the intermission room, unlike Curse 1, it starts you off as the character that joined your party, not Zangetsu. Of course, then, as a speedrunner playing Ultimate, you have to switch back to Zang as fast as possible so you can run through the stage as opposed to slowly walking it, because Zang is the only character that can run. This is minor, but it makes jumping forth between both games as a speedrunner a little annoying since this part is flipped. And for our Corgi and Jeebel, Weapon points received from purple candles have been reduced from 5 to 3 because we just had it too good in Curse of the Moon 1. I mean, too good. The game is visually somehow even more impressive than Curse of the Moon 1 was. I kid you not, the first time I played this game, my mind was blown at how big of an improvement they made for the graphics. I compare it a lot to the first time I played Castlevania 3 after having familiarized myself with the visuals of Castlevania 1. I had practically the same initial experience. Everything was so vivid and all the sprites of the game, be it characters or platforms or backgrounds or enemies, felt a lot fuller than anything in Curse 1. Movement is another big improvement at least as far as ultimate mode is concerned. They basically fixed running. In Curse 1, running was annoyingly precise. The game had a very tight window for when you needed to press the dash button after landing so that you can start running again. This meant that you had to be insanely accurate to optimize Zengetsu's speed during your run. In the beginning, I foolishly defaulted to mashing the dash button in Curse the Moon 1 constantly, destroying my controllers. And what makes that even worse is this doesn't even work. When your gun's blazing, dashing a button constantly, you're not really getting precision, you're basically getting random speed. Some of the time you will get the input on landing right when you need it, but other times you will miss and start walking instead of running. And now it is several frames until you hit the dash button the next time. This works a lot nicer in Curse 2. It just feels way more forgiving. Clearly they made the window a lot bigger because they saw that it was giving people problems. And as a bonus, the length of time that one dash lasts is also longer compared to the first game. This also helps with this problem. And now some of you may think that this is not that important. Well, you'd be wrong. I want to throw back real quick to the Curse 1 quickscope where I demonstrated how door skipping saves time. To recap, the act of going out of bounds to skip a door transition isn't a major time save if you just look at one door being skipped. However, when you multiply that maybe half a second or so that is saved times how many doors there are in the game that can be skipped, by the time you hit the credits, consistent door skipping has saved you somewhere around 10 seconds on your run, which is great and that's why the speedrunners do it. Now when it comes to the difference between landing and dashing immediately versus landing, going into walk and then dashing, it's a hair of a difference. It is so much less of a time save 
than the door skip was. We're talking frames, but it's something that happens way more frequently than door skipping, which in the long run can also be another nice time save if you can do it consistently throughout your run. Let's see just how many moments there are where Zangetsu lands and the player will need to immediately hit the dash button in the first level of Curse the Moon 1. You can see it took a whole 31 times for just the first level out of 8 total. We can then assume on average a speedrunner will get 248 opportunities to lose a handful of frames from a missed input during a precise window when Zangetsu's feet hit the floor. And all this while you also have to focus on other platforming concerns, enemies, projectiles, hazards, holding attack to charge and pressing other buttons too. It can be stressful. I can only imagine a second thumb could help with all of this face button management. Some players remap the buttons to play this category. I actually started using a method where I bring over my index finger to slide over the dash button to reduce the workload off my thumb. I call this the claw method. It's not 100% effective all of the time and has other challenges, but it worked mostly great so far, so I just keep doing it. So I hope that you could see exactly why I'm so fixated on this improvement for the sequel. By comparison, Curse 2 Ultimate has more flow from simply fixing this one issue. I mean, look at how smooth you run in this game. The player even has enough time to throw a sub weapon down backwards and land and keep on running without delay. This would be a godsend for the Curse 1 Ultimate speedrun. It would help optimize runs so much better just because you don't have to worry about an extra step. It's resolved, it's fixed. Keeping this in mind, Curse 2 Ultimate was a lot of fun learning strats, and there was even a moment or two where I learned things that I didn't see anybody else doing, which makes me believe that I discovered something new, like on my own. That was neat. I've been picking up and learning strats used in awesome runs by awesome speedrunners who are insanely talented this whole time, but I've never discovered a trick myself. For instance, in stage 6 on the very first room, there's a few ways you can get up from the middle to the last platform. Some faster, some slower but less risky. Eventually I realized that you could use Dominique's big jump, then change to Zhang and double jump, purposely taking a hit from the enemy on the top. Once you fall down, quickly turn back to Dominique to pogo the candle and change back to the Zangetsu double jumping. And now, with the iframes from that initial hit, you still have just enough time to get to the door without taking a second hit. It isn't pretty. I'm not sure if it's faster necessarily. I haven't tested it, but it's pretty consistent and I enjoy doing this trick. To bring the point home, anytime I'm speedrunning Curse 1 these days, I 90% of the time wish I was speedrunning Curse 2. Part of that is my desire to play something different, but a big reason is simply the movement is less tedious and this makes it more enjoyable to speedrun because I'm not hyper focused on pin precision dash inputs. Also, I get to play as a card game. In conclusion, Curse the Moon 2 feels like what I thought it felt like to play Curse 1 Ultimate Mode thanks to these improvements in movement. I had always referred to playing ultimate mode as Zangetsu flying all over the place. But in Curse 1, there is a lot of stopping the flow thanks to these missed inputs. Because of this, going back to the original game now feels clunky and outdated. From a casual perspective, they improved a lot visually, made the game insanely challenging to the point it may even be off-putting for many players because of unfair levels of punishing gameplay, and gave us refreshing new characters and stages to play. This is a great sequel for diehards of difficult platforming games and a must for a Castlevania fan. If you thought Curse 1 was good, you need to play this game. You may not like it at first, but there is something in here for you. From my speedrunning perspective, they made this game simultaneously worse and better to speedrun with the various tweaks and improvements they made. Some of those changes made me feel like they were watching the speedrunning community breaking apart the first game with out of bounds glitches for faster times. They could even be watching this video right now. You should do a bloodstained pachinko for April Fools. And thanks for watching everybody. I hope this video made you feel something. Please like, comment, subscribe if you liked it. 
I really want to stress how initially frustrated I was with the overall game, but came around to it once I could finally play Curse 2 on Ultimate. I also didn't even get to talk about Legend difficulty that they later added, or some of the other modes like Solo, and I still have yet to do much with the co-op. I've played the co-op like twice, which is pretty sad. Like I said, the co-op was a highlight for me from the announcement that only ended up being pretty disappointing due to the lack of an online feature giving me little opportunities to actually use it. And I'm sorry if this quick scope was a little shorter than usual, I had to do one on this game because of my strong opinions about aspects I like or dislike, but also I'm saving up my time and energy for the next one, which I won't tell you what that is just yet, but I will give you one hint and I hope that you don't take this hint personally.